So, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ernesto Amaral. I'm an associate professor uh, in the sociology department, and I'm going to be the one teaching this class, Sociology 312, Population Society. All right, so why we'll always do like this. Uh, people can watch from home or you can come in class. And um, I'm also recording the lecture and I'm going to post it on my YouTube channel so you can watch it afterwards if you want. And all this information I'm going to go uh, in detail right now on, on the syllabus. From home, sometimes I cannot see the chat depending on which software I'm using here. So uh, I will let you know if I can see the chat or not. But if I'm not seeing it, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask any question. Okay, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask it. I'm gonna share my screen now. The idea from home is that if I'm gonna share my screen so you can better see the screen because if I just try to zoom out here, you're not gonna see it. And, um, and you're gonna see a little window with me on the side. That's what you should see. Can you see my screen from home? Ethan Whitaker, if you can just wave, I can see you. Can you see? Cool, thanks. Um, so this is the syllabus that I, I sent the link yesterday to you uh, by email. I'm sorry about the lights here. It's just everything was fascinating. I have to play with the lights a little bit in the back there. Um, so we will meet, I don't know exactly where, if it's gonna be here or another room this next few days, throughout the end of the semester. We, I pretty much, I prefer to use this course website here in which I will upload all slides, all uh, files, all the material that I have for this class will be available on that link. And uh, so you don't need any login and password to, to access it. You can just go to the link and download everything. The slides will be in PDF. It's just an easier way to upload it to the website. And uh, I will use Canvas. Canvas, you can already access it as well, uh, but it's gonna be only to, I will send you emails throughout the semester directly by email but I will save those emails in Canvas so you have a record there. And also all the quizzes and exams will be done online. You don't even have to come to class. You can do it from home, from the library, wherever place you are. And I will also post the grades there. So Canvas is pretty much just to record the emails that I'm gonna send you throughout the semester for you to answer uh, quizzes and exams and for me to post grades. And of course, you all know the Zoom link. The passcode is now required. And this is the link to the YouTube channel that I will upload my lectures. So if you just click here on this link, it goes to the page. This is my haircut pre-pandemic. And uh, since March 1st, no haircut. And uh, uh, so here is the direct page. If you don't remember this path, you can just go to ernestomoral.com under teaching, go to demography. And then here, 2021 spring population society, you go to exactly that same page, okay? The syllabus that I'm showing right now is already available. The PDF file is here. Information about the Canvas website, the Zoom link, it's Pretty much this beginning here is the same thing as the, uh, the syllabus. This document here with instructions to Zoom, of course, everybody knows by this point, more than a year that we have been uh, like this, but this file here is this one, in which I just give you details. If someday you have problems with connection, you cannot access it through the link, you can access it through this phone number and using the meeting ID and the passcode. You are muted once you enter, but you can unmute yourself. 
for example, right now I cannot see the chat. So if you write something in the chat, I cannot see it. So it's better for you to just unmute yourself and ask a question, okay? So that is just regular stuff about Zoom. Um, and then here, like office hours, I'm not gonna do face-to-face uh, -face office hours in my office, but I will be open to have office hours on Zoom, and that's the link for that. And you just email me asking for a specific day and time to meet, and then we can uh, meet it there. So it's much more flexible. So it doesn't have to be in a specific day of the week, a specific time. It can be according to your schedule as well. But take advantage, and then we can meet there. If I'm talking to another student at the same time, you're gonna be placed in the waiting room. And as soon as I finish with the student, I will um, add into the session. Um, quizzes and exams will be submitted on Canvas. And these are some instructions about online quizzes and exams. This file here is already available there and is the same as this one. Here, I pretty much say what's the style of the, the quizzes, exam, and final exams throughout the semester. We are going to have um, 20 quizzes. And uh, so it's going to be two multiple questions, 0.5 points each uh, quiz. And it's going to open at 4.30 at the end of the class. And you can submit it until 12 p.m. the following day. Some people in the previous semester complained that 12 p.m. is a bad deadline because they might be doing something else. But it's from 4.30 p.m. in one day until 12 p.m. in the next day to answer two multiple choice questions. Okay, and once you start it, you have five minutes to answer to complete the quiz. And it's gonna be all on Canvas. So all quizzes and exams will be on Canvas. The online exam, uh, it's gonna be 40 multiple choice questions, 0.5 points uh, for each question. So 20 points in total. In those days that we have exams, you don't have to come to class. The exam is gonna be open on Canvas from one to 8 p.m. on the exam day, and you have one hour and 15 minutes to finish it once you start it. The final exam, the standard A&M, is that you have two hours and 30 minutes to complete the exam. So uh, you have more time to answer the same amount of questions. And some students complain about the amount of questions that I had in the exam was 50, so I dec decreased it to 40 questions per exam but you're gonna be able to see just one question at a time. And once you answer that question, you cannot go back, okay? And this is what I'm explaining in the bottom here. So just read this document as well. And um, here I pretty much just say for quizzes, you're gonna have two minutes and 30 seconds per question and the exam one minute and 52 seconds, final exam three minutes and 45 seconds. Okay, so just try to manage your time when you answer those questions. And this document here is in the website. The link is here, instructions about online quizzes and exams. And the link is also on the syllabus, right, um, right here. I'm gonna talk about the course objectives here, but uh, sorry, sorry, right here. Students should read instructions about online quizzes, exams, and final exam. So, so these are more technical uh, things. Um, in the website, afterwards here, you're gonna see, this is the link to download the lecture. So the lecture for today, for related to chapter one is already available, you can download it. And I have here some videos, kind of extra material, if you wanna uh, watch those videos. I think would be helpful for you. And, and then you're gonna see the same style for the next uh, chapters. The uh, days three and four, we have scheduled chapter 10. It's not available there yet. So in this case, if you click here, it's gonna say that this file was not yet uploaded, but I will do it soon. But all these other files here, that you, this one is an Excel file compressed, you should be able already to download it. 
And uh, so it's going to be all this uh, materials for each one of the lectures. In each day of these lectures, I'm going to go and explain what each one of these material is. The lectures only for chapter one is available now. The other ones are not, but you should be able to download all these other material here already. And towards the end, there are some links that they are not files, just some links to documentaries and um, articles. And more videos as well. And afterwards, after we finish the material for each one of the days, we have the, um, um, I have I organized here some links for a series of different materials related to our course. And so here about the pandemic, uh, uh, links from the US Census Bureau, other demographic resources. If you try to click on any of these links and it doesn't work, please just let me know and we'll try to fix it because sometimes these this websites, they change the address, okay? So this is the website that's where you are going to get all the course material in Canvas. It's really simple. Um, it's, you're going to see, let me just show how you see it. How can I see as a student? There is a place here. Probably it's on the screen, but I cannot see. Uh, student view here. So you have only the home menu here. That's just the beginning of the syllabus, the announcements. This is the email that I sent to you guys, so I saved it here yesterday. The assignments will be posted here. So we will have um, 20 quizzes and, and the exams. They're not yet available, of course, and you're gonna be able to see your grades as well, okay? So that's the, Canvas is really simple. It's just to where you do your online exam and quizzes and where you see your grades, pretty much that. Uh, back to the syllabus. So I showed you the course website and the Canvas website. And the lectures. This is my, um, my YouTube channel. This is the playlist from last semester, Introduction to Demography Fall 2020. And um, the, these are all the interviews that I did. This one was the same class from spring 2020. So I will just create another playlist at the top here for spring 2021, where I'm gonna post this, these lectures, okay? Which is pretty much what you're seeing here right now. So that's the, the YouTube channel. The, good, I already talked about this. Yeah, I mean, my office is an academic building for, 12, for 15, but it's just better to have office hours on Zoom. And what is this course? <laughs> We're gonna talk here. Uh, it's gonna be an introduction to demography, right? Class, so and the formal name is Population and Society. The idea is to discuss and introduce the main concepts in demography. And we're gonna cover the three components in demography, which are fertility, mortality, and migration. Right, so we're gonna have an overview at the beginning, this introduction, and then afterwards, we're gonna show current trends or historical and current trends in demography in the world, in, in the US, and then we're gonna go afterwards into these specific components of fertility, mortality, migration. And here we are going to talk about demography, not in a technical term. I'm gonna show you a lot of uh, tables, a lot of data, graphs, maps, and all that. But the idea here is not to calculate anything. I'm gonna show you how to calculate some of these rates, some of these indicators, for example, life expectancy at birth the average number of years that people are living in a specific society in a specific year. I'm gonna show you how to estimate total fertility rate, the average number of children that women are having in a specific society in a specific year. 
But I'm not going to ask you to do that by hand or anything. I'm going to just show you how to do it. And I'm, that's what those Excel files are for that I showed you on my website. And uh, we're going to, the emphasis here is to try to interpret these results. So it's more a sociological approach to demography. That's why it's called social demography. And what is demography specifically? We are pretty much trying to uh, study the changes in the size of the populations, in the composition of the population. What's the percentage of the population by sex, by age, by race, ethnicity, and so on. And also where these people are located, the distribution of these populations in, in the space. Um, in the specific uh, chapter, I'm going to talk, uh, give you some more in-depth uh, analysis. I'm going to show you some of those websites that I showed in my, some of those links that I showed in my website. They go to external websites that provide data for free related to demography. So I'm going to show you where you can get that data for free. And then you can also make some calculations if you want in the future. Okay. Um, and all these uh, demographic changes and the composition of the population nowadays, what we, I'm going to emphasize here, that's more important to understand the composition than be concerned only with the size of the population. That's a, a major topic that we're going to discuss throughout the semester. We're going to uh, cover topics related to population growth and decline, age, sex composition, where to get data, association between demography and other socioeconomic outcomes, and um, explain some methods in demography and concepts in demography. What, for example, we are periods, cohorts, the Lexis diagram, talk about mortality measures, fertility measures, and uh, migration measures as well. So that's what I'm talking here. And I'm going to go more in depth a little bit about this um, course description in our first um, lecture that I'm going to start as soon as we finish this syllabus. Okay. Course learning objectives, identify main concepts and methods in demography, explain links between demography and other aspects of our society, evaluate general demographic trends in the world based on data that other people collected. If we you have an agency or an institution that collect the data and use their data, that's secondary data. So we're going to analyze a lot of public available secondary data. If I collect the data by myself in my research team, that's primary data collection. In this case, here we're going to be doing secondary data analysis, right? Perceive, analyze, and discuss the dynamics of human populations. Investigate population issues from the perspective of the social sciences. So it's really social demography in this case. And I think, let me just see something. I'm trying to just show the chat here in front of the window, but it doesn't show. Let me just see. Yeah. The textbook that we're going to use for this class is this Population Society Introduction to Demography by Dudley uh, Poston. He was a professor here in the sociology department. He retired recently, so I'm just going to keep using the same book that he used. And you can buy it or rent at our bookstore. And you have the different uh, prices here to rent, use new, buy, use new. And you can also uh, buy the electronic version on Amazon, which I just checked today is the cheapest one that you have today. These prices, they vary a lot, but the e-textbook is $37 on Amazon. Okay? So that's pretty much the book that we're going to use throughout the whole semester. I'm going to use uh, additional material, but it's you don't have to buy, it's going to be all available in the course website. This is the structure of our uh, uh, of exams and quizzes that we're going to have. I talked a little bit about it already to you. 
So we're gonna have four exams, exam one, two, three, and the final exam, 20% of uh, the final grade in each one of them, 40 questions, 0.5 points per question, and the quizzes, uh, two questions. No, wait, I, I wrote something wrong somewhere here. The quizzes, uh, wait, how many quizzes I have? I'm sorry about that. There is just one little problem here, so it should be quizzes 20. No, so it's 0.5 points. This is wrong here. It's two questions, 0.5 points per question. So the information here is, is correct. Okay, so that's just my mistake. Two questions, 0.5 points per question. I will correct this. And uh, I will also give opportunities for extra credit throughout the semester as well. The exams will be given online in Canvas and will be pretty much multiple choice questions. And there will be no face-to-face -face classes on exam date. The same thing for the final exam. And the final exam, uh, by coincidence, is going to be on the Tuesday after class is finished. But it's usually I just follow the, the standard from the university on where to give the final exam, as you all uh, already know. But also, you'll be able to take the final exam from home. Quizzes will be available on Canvas from 4.30 p.m. on the day that you have a quiz. Not all days you have quizzes until 12 p.m. the following day. And those instructions about online quizzes, exams, and final exams is available here, which is that one that I already showed to you earlier today. Okay, that's this, this file here. Um, students keep asking me throughout the semester if I, I grade on a curve. No, I do not grade on a curve, and I make it really clear in the syllabus, right? So it's pretty much the grade that you get in the exam. Uh, I, you give extra credit activities, but I will not grade on a curve. So you're not competing with other students, so feel free to form those uh, group me uh, sessions and then just discuss among yourselves or meet in campus in a safer manner and study in groups, and that's uh, completely okay, of course. And I will provide these extra credit uh, uh, quizzes and assignments throughout the semester. Yeah. This is the main structure of our course. We might get delayed some weeks here. That's normal. That happens in all the the semester. So today we're discussing the syllabus and then start on chapter one. This notation here is pretty much chapter one from the post on book. Okay. So introduction to demography. And then we jump to chapter 10 to talk about age and sex composition. Chapter 12, word population change over time. Chapter 13, population change in the US. And then exam one. 20 points. And you see here that the first quiz will be on uh, next Tuesday, on January 26th, because the deadline to add and drop classes in the university is January 25th on Monday. So I just do the first quiz the day after. So the students that register to this class late on, they don't miss any quiz. Right? So that's the reason. But the quiz one will be available from 4.30 p.m. on January 26th until 12 p.m. on January 27th um, uh, on Canvas. And how exactly are these quizzes and exam questions? I have pretty much question banks. I have a bunch of questions about each chapter that I have already uh, created. And uh, Canvas will randomly select the number of questions for each one of you. So the questions that each student will answer are different. And also even the order of the alternatives are different, is different as well. And, but the questions that you're gonna get in the exam one come from the same question banks that I use for quizzes one, two, three, four, five. So when you are answering the quizzes, 
you are already trained for the style of the exam because it's pretty much the same thing. It's going to be one question at a time from the same question banks, and in this case, the same topic. The difference is that quiz is only two questions, one point in total, and exams, 40 questions, 20 points in total. And the exam one is going to be about the material that we discussed from lectures one through seven. If we get delayed and we don't cover all these topics here, the exam one is going to be only about the material from lectures one to seven, right? So the exams will not change the date, but we might get a little delayed on the, um, on the topics. The standard that I did here is that in the class after the exam, we don't have a quiz. So the, that's why you see this jump here from quiz five, you don't have anything, and then quiz six. After we talk, give this general idea of demography, age and sex composition, a demography in the world, demography in the US. Then we're gonna talk a little bit more theoretical, theories of demography that try to explain the changes in demography through time. Then I'm gonna show you some sources of demographic data. And that's where I'm going to show you a brief, uh, uh, just a couple of few slides. And then afterwards, I'm going to show you those links, a couple of, not all of them, but some of those links that we have in my website. And then we will cover chapter four about fertility, no class on March 2nd, and chapter seven, mortality. And we have exam two on materials covered from nine to 15. So it's not cumulative, exam two, just about this, the topics covered on these days here. Continuing March, March 18th, because of the schedule of the university, that's a redefined day. Students attended their Friday classes, so we don't have a class here. And it's also a good day for everybody to celebrate my birthday. So just remember that. <laughs> Just kidding, but it's true. Uh, <laughs> then we're gonna go to chapter eight about internal migration, chapter nine, international migration. International migration, there is more material, that's why I'm gonna cover in more days. And then chapter 11 about race ethnicity. And here in the middle, we're gonna have exam three, okay? Covering the topics from lecture 17 to 22. And then finish race ethnicity, family and sexuality, chapter five, cons uh, contraception birth control, chapter six. And then the final exam, like I said, on the Tuesday after we finish the classes, that's the formal day that the university put us to have the final exam. But again, for us, it doesn't make a difference is that you're gonna take on Canvas from wherever you are, you're gonna have just more time, two hours and 30 minutes. And it's again, not cumulative. It's uh, only materials covered from uh, 24 to 28. So actually it's technically less material than we're gonna uh, cover on the previous exams. And these are the other chapters that are available in the textbook that we probably won't have time to cover. And I will also put my slides to those chapters as well on the course website, okay? Any questions so far? All good? From home, any questions? And here, uh, some uh, more information from the department and the university. The Department uh, of Sociology has this diversity and civility statement. This is a serious thing that we encountered in past years in, in our classrooms. Students not respecting each other and students not respecting faculty. So it's pretty much here. Let's just, the topics that we're going to talk in this course are really controversial as usually are sociology topics, but let's just be really um, respectful to each other and have great discussions. Whenever you guys ask questions, that's when I think we have more discussions and good and go more in depth in the analysis but let's just be respectful in, in, the, in these discussions, both among ourselves and with faculty as well, okay? I mean, 
everything in this course can be controversial. If you think uh, fertility, we're going to talk about contraception. Mortality, we're going to talk about differentials in mortality by socioeconomic status. Uh, migration, it's a huge topic in the country right now that started being really a national debate since the 2016 presidential elections. So everything can be really controversial, but what we emphasize here in the sociology department is knowledge based on science. So if you want to bring a different point of view, that's important. But all the discussion here, we are at the university, has to be based on science. Okay, So that's the main message that I'm going to try to talk here. We are doing social science. Everything at the university is based on science. No, no more than that. Um, Class participation, I will not take attendance in each class. Uh, during the pandemic, it's crazy. You pretty much can stay at home and or you can watch the, the lectures afterwards on YouTube. You can download the PDF and watch them. Some students, they gave some feedback this last semester saying that the, the structure of the class is not good, but I mean, I'm just trying to do all things. Right, I'm here in person, I'm recording, I'm doing it live on Zoom, I'm putting the, the recording like in a, on YouTube where you don't need to have any password or anything. I'm just trying to make everything easy for everybody. Of course, if you are in person, uh, we can talk a little more, but I will keep wearing my mask. I, um, there is this thing about having to look at students in the chat and I lose a little bit of contact with you guys, but, but that's the reality, you know, that's, that's the best I can do in this situation. Um, I will not take attendance in, in each class, but I do think I, I will not give points for class participation. That would be just too hard to know who participated or not, both in class and on Zoom. But I really like the times that I, I had, um, more fun in this class is exactly when students ask questions, right? And of course, the same thing related to the previous uh, statement, hate speech will not be tolerated in the classroom. So let's just be respectful to each other, here, okay? If you, uh, we are not gonna have, probably maybe we're gonna have a couple of assignments where you have to write and so, but most of our exam and quizzes are gonna be pretty much multiple choice questions. But if any of the assignments you have to write a short essay and you have difficulty putting your ideas uh, into the document, you can always use the University Writing Center to help you with that. So that's, the, that's why you have this information here. Uh, all everybody, it's welcome to use laptop at home. Uh, of course not, laptop in the classroom and take your notes directly in the computer. Lately, I'm trying to take my notes more in the computer than a piece of paper because I always miss my paper. My children take the paper and I don't know where they are. So it's uh, um, all welcome, but just try to concentrate on the topic that we discuss in the class. The, um, you can also, one, some people found useful in these previous semesters, they get the PDF file from the lectures and print them like three slides per page and then write comments on the side while I'm teaching the class. So you can do that as well, that's up to you. I might change the lectures throughout the semester, add a couple of slides or delete some, but if you print as soon as I upload it, it's not gonna change so much. And if you have that printed in paper while you're here in the class, maybe it's a good way to take notes as well. As you know, since the last semester, the student course evaluation changed from PITA to this IFE system. So this is just to let you know that's gonna be available there at the end of the semester to evaluate this course. Office hours, I intend to assist you guys on doubts that you have throughout the semester. It's not an opportunity for me to teach the whole uh, lecture again. So just come try to be more prepared with your questions if you, miss some of the, the, the questions because of like a disease or something. I understand that I would have to talk a little more, but try to take advantage of office hours. Students usually don't take as much. 
And in this online system is actually better because then we can meet at any time throughout the week. It doesn't have to be in specific time during the week, as I said before. Students are not allowed to submit their coursework after the due date. Uh, just in the case of excused absences under the student rule seven, then I can reopen quizzes and reopen exams so you can take them in a later uh, time, but it has to be uh, considered an excused absence under the student rule 70, and you all guys know about it here. And this is the link to access it. These are standard university policies. Um, students required to quarantine or self-isolate should still participate in courses and course-related activities remotely and must not attend face-to-face uh, -face course activities. And in our course, it's kind of easy because then you can uh, watch it uh, through Zoom or afterwards on, on YouTube. And some people, exactly that, they, they get sick, they cannot even attend the class on Zoom the same day, but then they can watch in a later day on YouTube, and the person just sends me the, the doctor note by email, just take a picture and send by email, and I will reopen the quiz or the exam after you have watched the lectures on YouTube, right? It's really simple. I try to make everything really simple here. Um, students will be excused from attending class on the day of a great activity or when attendance contributes to a student's grade. This makeup work policy here, it's this, all these sections under university policies, I cannot change any of the wording here. So this is standard that you should, at least you should see in all syllabi of professors in the university. The makeup policy for us, it's easy, like I just said here now. It's an excused absence under student rule seven. Just send me the, the document proving that by email. Take your time to watch the lecture on YouTube afterwards and I reopen the activity for you. If you have any questions before taking the exam or the quiz, just set up an office hours with me, okay? Uh, academic integrity, statement policy, and Nagy doesn't lie, cheat or steal, or tolerate those who do. So yeah, just, there was this even uh, a news article that just came out a couple of weeks ago about in the previous semester, they find a lot of people cheating in, in the university, and there was like this huge meeting at the university trying to deal with that. I don't think I had a problem in this class. I think the way that I set up with these question banks, randomly selected questions, one question at a time, I had the opposite uh, complaint of students that it was too hard. And uh, that's why I decreased the number of questions per exam instead of 50, 40. And, um, and one thing that a lot of students miss those quizzes that I don't understand because quizzes are worth 20 points out of the final grade, the whole grade. So if you miss all quizzes, the maximum that you can get is an 80%, not taking into account credit, extra credit activities. 20% of quizzes, those are good, not because it's just one point here, one point there, 0 0.5 here or whatever. You are training to the exam by taking those because they are similar style from the same, from the same question bank. Right? So I did not have this issue here as all the professors had at the university. And for you guys who don't have an issue with lower grades in your exam one, just take it, the quizzes on a regular basis, don't miss that. A lot of people could have gotten Bs, got Cs, a lot of people could have gotten As, they got Bs, right? So that's up to you to do the work throughout the semester. Americans with Disability Act policy, if you have any sort of disability, just get in touch with uh, disability.tamu.edu. They give you a, a document and then you can just send me the document. Uh, you don't have to tell me what your disability is. In our case here, since everything is online, I already give all these slides. You can download everything. Uh, 
I, I guess the only thing that maybe some people could request is more time to answer the exams and, and, and final exam, but it has to pass through their office, right? Through the disability resources in the student service bureau, okay? Title IX in Statement of Limits of Confidentiality. Uh, here we have all the information about uh, if you pass through any incident related to discrimination or harassment, any kind of harassment, you have a lot of resources to report it at the university. And one of the resources are faculty. So faculty members are resources who you can uh, report any issues that you have with discrimination or harassment. In our case, faculty, we are mandatory reporters. So if you tell me something, I do have to report it to the head of my department or to someone above me in the administration here at the a and But if you want to report someone and that you don't want that person to report to someone else, you have to go to someone who is not a mandatory reporter. I'm a mandatory reporter in the sense of having to pass it, it to other people. You can just look at the university rules and see which would be the best um, person or group or that you would like to better report the, the, the incident that you have faced. You have faced. State, if you have problems, any issues with mental health or wellness, there is also, uh, there are a lot of resources at the university here as well, and even a link where you can um, connect it and, and try to get some help. This link here for Title IX, it's uh, related to the issues of discrimination and harassment. That's where you can get more uh, information about where to report your incident, right? And you have all these different people that you can write and, and try to solve your issue. And these are the same sessions related to the pandemic. Uh, students who have fever or the symptoms of COVID-19 should participate in class remotely. If that is an option and it is for us and should not participate in face-to-face -face Instruction face covering uh, must be properly worn in all private spaces, including classrooms. For me, it was a surprise to see people here outside the classroom, but in, inside the building, not wearing uh, masks. But I, I do not understand why. And uh, to attain a face to face class, students must properly wear an approved face covering. If a student refuses, I will just get out of the room. I can turn this everything off here in 10 seconds and I just get out of the room and that's it, okay? So just, just wear the mask properly. If not, I just stop everything and stop the class. Easy. I'm just following the university rules. Cool. Um, again, students are required to quarantine or to participate in courses, in course related activities remotely. If that, is an op if that option is available, which is it, it is for our case, and must not attend face-to-face -face course activities. Okay. So all these parts here are statements uh, from the department and from the university. I'm just following the standard that uh, is given to us. Any questions? All good? Cool. So the lecture, 15 minutes to go, we still have time. No, 30 minutes to go. I'm confused now, yeah, 3.15 to 4.30. Yeah, sorry, yeah, we have a lot of time. I, <laughs> I'm gonna be just really honest with you guys. I mean, I also got complaints with students saying that my lectures are, um, my courses are really heavy on lectures. I talk too much for one hour and 15 minutes and it seems that one hour and 15 minutes for the new generation, that's a long time to pay attention to someone. In my time, if a professor was just trying to engage students and try to create all these different activities in the classroom and show videos and everything, 
I would think that the professor was lazy, right? So I don't want to think that I am lazy. So I'm just going to teach the content and I'm going to go even over what is taught in the textbook. But again, the time that I had more fun and the discussions went more in depth in the classroom, that's when students ask questions. And the interesting thing is that actually in semesters that I had low, the lowest enrollments in this course, that's when students ask more questions. I think they felt less intimidated with each other. I don't know now if you're gonna feel intimidated by asking questions and students in online, but please don't feel it. There is no bad questions or dumb questions or anything like that, right? But that's my style. I feel that if I don't teach to you what I'm supposed to teach, which is introduction to demography, and the content is in the textbook, the textbook doesn't have so many uh, topics that I think is important for us, so I bring other things outside it. And other topics that are in the textbook, I don't think they are so important, so I, I don't cover them in the classroom, so, but if I don't cover those topics, I don't think that I'm being a good professor. So technically, if you just say that my class is lecture heavy, I don't take it as a criticism because you can just interrupt me at any time and ask questions and we stop and we discuss. I showed in my course website a bunch of different videos on each one of the, related to each one of the topics throughout the semester. You can watch those videos afterwards. If you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. But that's all over there and I already compile everything in a single place. Okay, just trying to be really honest with you here about my style. I hear a lot of the, 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 the complaints, I understand it. I change the format of the exam. I, I change the style of the office hours, so it's more flexible now, but they are some just styles that we cannot change about ourselves, that's how we are, okay? So, the chapter one, an introduction to demography. We are going to discuss the definition of demography. I'm gonna present you the demographic equation, talk about like what are variables and observations. So for example, this topic about variables and observations is not in the textbook, that's extra, extra information. But it's just this understanding what variables are and observations are it's easier for us to understand what a database is. And that's going to be something that we're going to use throughout the semester. Give you some updated information about the coronavirus pandemic, just to show how to better understand the pandemic. You have to go to different data sources to get this information. And this is always, it's being updated daily, as you all know. Talk to you about demographic models, like how we can classify demography in different ways based on what topic we are covering. What are cohorts and generations? I think we all here have heard about the baby boom cohort, millennials. So all these uh, concepts are important for demographers because we study the same people changing over time in their socioeconomic uh, indicators. The Lexis diagram is pretty much a graph that shows us cohorts over time. So it's just to show you the Lexis diagram is something that demographers use a lot to understand how people are changing over time. And uh, I'm gonna show you really briefly here. And it's not in the textbook as well. And then I'm gonna uh, talk about the differences between ratios, rates, and probabilities. Sometimes people are showing ratios and they call them rates and vice versa, or use the term probability, but actually they're talking about rates. So I'm just gonna explain what ratios are, rates and probabilities, and these terms we're gonna use again throughout, throughout the whole semester. Cool? So demography is the scientific study of human population. And this term was first created by the Belgian statistician Achille Guillard in 1855. 
in the elements of human statistics or compared demography. And uh, so that's how we started using the term demography as the sub-science in social science that studies the human population. And you might have heard this, uh, this phrase that demography is destiny. It's a little, it's a strong sentence and some people um, criticize it because it just puts demography too much in the center of all um, human analysis. But this term demography is uh, destiny, which was um, created by Auguste Comte, a mathematician and philosopher from France. And he is known as being the father of sociology. He's just pretty much trying to emphasize that demography shapes the world. And maybe it's not the single determinant of what's going on in our societies, but it's associated with several other things. I mean, I'm going to go back to international migration, to immigration to the US, for example. Whenever you're talking about immigration, people are concerned with the labor market, the effect that immigration might have on the labor markets and the earnings of the, the American population, on the US born population. So immigration is not causing all the changes in the labor market in the US or in any other society, but it's related to that. Uh, the fertility decline. When you have fewer children in the population, we don't need so many resources being expanded to, to schools anymore. And after a while, you're gonna also have fewer proportion of workers because these children, that fewer children leave, you become adults and proportionally, they're gonna be a smaller group in the population. So demography is affecting how our society is composed. It's gonna affect the economy, it's gonna affect uh, uh, politics in the country and so on. When we talk about demography's destiny, it's not that demography is the explanation of everything in the world in our human societies, but it's one important factor in understanding what's going on in our society, okay? Population change is an underlying component of almost everything happening in the world today and therefore in the future as well. And this example that I gave to you about uh, fertility changes, you get fewer children, smaller proportion of children, and then a smaller proportion of uh, people in labor ages. So the changes in fertility in a specific time you have effects for decades in the future, okay? John Grant uh, was an English statistician considered to be the founder of demography. And the interesting thing that he did is that he analyzed various statistics from the London population. And he pretty much used weekly statistics of death in the early modern London and using these vital statistics, pretty much death certificates from London, he created a series of methods trying to understand the trends in mortality in London at that time. And this series of analysis, that's what he called the bills of mortality. So he pretty much studied death records, death certificates that had been uh, kept by London parishes since 1532. So he was able to analyze this data for several decades, okay, or almost centuries. And he noticed analyzing these death certificates that there were some regularities in who is dying, at what age, in terms of sex. So even with all this data from 1532, he was already able to understand some regularities in relation to mortality. And he published a book natural and political observations made upon the bills of mortality in 1662, emphasizing, explaining his main methods and also uh, his main findings. And his main findings, his main substantive contributions were these three here. He recognized the phenomenon of uh, rural urban migration 
and the urban death rate exceeded the rural death rate at that time. Nowadays, we have uh, lower death rates in urban areas in contemporary societies, but at that time, the urban death rates, they were higher than the rural death rates. And he actually saw that the population was pretty much evenly distributed in terms of sex. Because male birth rates they, uh, was higher, were higher than female birth rates. So less females are born than males. And we're gonna discuss throughout the semester uh, that that is even the case for contemporary societies. Some societies, something like in China, South Korea, and some Asian countries, they have preference for sons. So if early in the pregnancy, the woman realizes that she's pregnant with a, a girl through ultrasound, some of them do an abortion because they would prefer to have a son. So that creates many more sons being born proportionally than, or even total numbers than, than girls. But also even in societies such as the US or Western Europe where you don't have a preference for sons, still the number of boys that are born are higher than the number of girls. Usually 105 boys for every 100 girls being born. That's the biological sex ratio. Sex ratio is pretty much the number of uh, boys divided by the number of girls. And when we are talking about the uh, number of babies being born in a specific year in a specific country, is the sex ratio at birth. The biological sex ratio at birth is usually 105 boys for every 100 uh, girls. Male uh, death rates was higher than female death rates. Females live longer than males. And that's still the case today. Women on average, they live longer than men. So what he pretty much uh, was able to see, even with this data from uh, the 1500s and the 1600s, was that you have more men being born in total, more boys being born than girls, but they die faster than girls. So the society is pretty much equally divided by, by sex. And he was the first one to present mortality in terms of survivorship. What's the number of people surviving up to a specific age? He was the first one to attempt to construct a life table. Life table is pretty much this technique that we use, and I'm gonna show in detail to you in the lecture about mortality when we cover the mortality chapter. You can do this in several different software packages. We're gonna show in Excel. And it's pretty much saying how many people survive to each one of the age groups. How many people are born? So age zero, how many of them survive to age 10? How many survive to age 15, 20, 25, and so on, until later age. And he was the first one to come up with the idea of analyzing mortality that way. And this is how we could um, illustrate a life table that he suggested. You have pretty much the age Specific ages here, 0, 6, 16, 26, 36, 46, until 86. How many people were born in a specific year in London? 100. How many survived to 86? 64. So 36 people in this example died between ages 0 and 6. How many people survived to age 16? 40. So 24 uh, people died between ages six and 16, until everybody dies. Nobody reaches age 86 in this example. So this is a really simple example of a life table, just showing how people were born and they survive until uh, specific ages. And based on this kind of information here, that's how you calculate life expectancy at birth. I don't know if you remember this, uh, this term, life expectancy at birth, but whenever you hear the term, the population specific country in specific year, the life expectancy at birth is 76. So it means that on average, those people are living 76 years based on their mortality 
uh, patterns on their mortality rates. And that information about people are living on average 76 years based on their mortality in that specific year is calculated using this tool here, the life table, right? So the life table is pretty much, we just use the simple um, style of organizing the data and then you create a series of calculations that will give you at the end the life expectancy at birth. And I'm gonna show you this in more detail later on. And so I showed you to you here uh, the main contributions that Grant had in terms of uh, substantial findings. And now the methodological contributions that he had is pretty much paid attention to quality. Microphone just got stuck in the table. I might have just broken it. Can you still hear me at home? Ethan? Cool. Um, so demographers are known to uh, pay attention to the quality of data. We pretty much don't take data as being 100% reliable. We're always trying to see if there is any problem of measurement in the data collection and so on. So we just have to be really skeptical about the data and question the, the reliability of the data every time that we use it. But usually when we use data from agencies such as uh, the Census Bureau or the CDC, for example, that we he have been hearing a lot during this pandemic, that the uh, NIH and so on, that data, data is really reliable. And, uh, but it's important for us to have this, what he called healthy skepticism in the sense that we have to question, but have to come up with questions about the quality of the data in a reasonable way. So he questioned the validity and reliability of data throughout his uh, studies. In the textbook, Dudley Poston uh, defines demography as being the scientific study of uh, the size, composition, and spatial distribution of human populations, right? So like I said, when I was talking about the, in the syllabus, we are not just concerned with like, how big the society is. We're also concerned about the composition of that population. What's the percentage of men and women? What's the percentage of younger people, people in labor ages, and people in older ages? What's the composition of people by race, ethnicity? What's the composition of people by socioeconomic status? All that are of interest of the of demographers. What's the uh, proportion of uh, households that have only one parent in the household, or have the two parents, or only the mother, or only the father? All these topics are of interest to, uh, to demographers. That's related to composition. Where are these people located? Are they all randomly distributed in an equal way through space, or are they more concentrated in the east and the west coast? Within Texas, are they all equally distributed in all the counties in Texas, or are they more concentrated in the big cities Houston, Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio. So all this analysis, not just the size, but also the composition and the spatial distribution, all these topics are important for demographers, okay? It, demography investigates changes in population size, composition, and distribution, resulting from fertility, mortality, and migration, right? The three components in, in demography, we're always trying to understand how they affect the size, the composition, the spatial distribution of the population. Demography helps understand what the past says about the future, given its expected population changes. You might have seen already, the, the, the United Nations has maybe the most famous uh, population projections, but the Census Bureau also has in several different uh, institutions they get historical trends of fertility, 
mortality in migration in specific countries, and they can do projections for the next decades, even to 50, 100 years ahead, and try to think how the population is gonna be. Not only the size, but also the composition and the spatial distribution. And that's important for policy matrix, because if we know that we're gonna have less children proportionally in the future, we're gonna to have to spend less resources on education, more resources for the elderly population, right? We're gonna to have to have more resources for social security, for example, when people get retired. So these projections in population, and, and that's actually uh, true for any science, and not just social science. Predicting the future, doing these projections, trying to see what's gonna happen in the future, that's the main goal. Here, in this course, you're going to first try to understand what's going on now and in the past. You're going to see some projections. But in any science, in any course that you are doing, our challenge is to try to understand what's going to happen in the future based on historical data and current data using scientific methods. What was one of the big problems in the 2008 economic crisis? that really few people predicted the economic crisis and then unemployment increased a lot and a lot of people suffered from that. So being able to see the signs of possible crisis in the future or even demographic composition is important for us. The pandemic as well. You could say, oh, we could not predict the pandemic. But, and we could also say that uh, China was uh, slow in telling other countries that the pandemic was serious, but they told us back in January last year that the masks were important to control the virus and that the virus was dangerous. We stopped the classes here at AM after spring break in March. When did we start wearing the masks? Maybe in April, May. I use all the time. I just mentioned to you guys here outside of the classroom, people not wearing masks inside the room, going to the grocery store. So being able to understand what might happen in the future based on science and make people understand those results, that's our goal. If we just criticize science because we have some other, other beliefs beyond science that blind our eyes, that's not gonna help our society. We have to make these decisions. We have to think, we have to try to understand what's gonna happen in the future based on with scientific knowledge and try to convince others or show to others how important that is, right? The US just reached now 400,000 deaths due, uh, due to the pandemic. Of course, not even in space throughout this time, but it's like 400,000 deaths in 10 months, on average 40,000 deaths per month. Again, of course, that's more concentrated in more recent months, but on average 40,000 per month. In this next month, up to mid-February, the upcoming new um, CDC director is already predicting, projecting, another 100,000 deaths. And so far we had 40,000 on average per month. Of course, more concentrated in recent months, but another 100,000. And that's based on projections, on the trends, on how people are socializing and so on, right? So understanding what we have now and think what's gonna happen in the future, it's a goal that we have not just as demographers, as sociologists, as political scientists, as economists, but as scientists. That's, that's what we are here for, right? And this here, it's a simple example of data in demography, just emphasize the first topic of interest in demography, the size of the population. And this is just a graph 
showing the, the population in 2020, 7.7 um, billion people. And each square here is proportional to the size of the population in each one of these countries. Right, so that's just to show how China and India are really big. US, also a big population, Brazil, Nigeria. Oh, by the way, I'm from Brazil. If you ask where I'm from, because of the accent. Okay. But you can, in my website, my, my, my CV is also there and you can figure it out as well. Oh yeah, I didn't give you this introduction because of the rush that we had at the beginning. And I got my PhD from UT, so that's not a good thing to say here in the classroom. <laughs> Uh, but, but, but I'm an egg now, so I'm, I'm changing and rooting for, for the eggs as well. But, um, so this is one example of how to show demographic data in a really simple, friendly way. But demography is not only concerned with population size, but with also whether the population is growing, declining, and with the three components which are also called the three processes in demography, fertility, mortality, and migration. Population distribution, where are these people usually living in this space? Population structure is usually related to age. You have a higher proportion of the people in younger ages, in labor ages between 15 and 54 years of age, or 15 and 64 years of age, or in older ages. Population characteristics, like I mentioned before some examples, by socioeconomic status, by race, ethnicity, um, by household composition, and so on. These are all population compositions that we can try to understand. And some of the primary demographic questions that we have related to exactly those topics that we just did, that I just showed. How large or small is the population? How is the population composed in terms of age, sex, race, marital status? What are the characteristics of the population? How is the population distributed in space? Because we know that the population is not randomly distributed in this space, not randomly distributed in the US, not randomly distributed within Texas, not randomly distributed within College Station, right? More people living here closer to the university than five, 10 miles from here. How population changes happen over time. Again, those projections that are really helpful for us to understand what's gonna be happening in the future so we can act in advance. And to answer these questions, demographers usually try to understand the changes in the level of fertility, mortality, and migration. So it's really hard to know what's going to happen in terms of demographic composition to the future. And exactly because being so difficult, demographers usually concentrate on specific areas. So you have demographers usually doing more work in fertility, others in mortality. I usually do more work on migration. So we can try to understand these changes, focusing on each one of these components. Okay, so I think it's, 4.30 now, and I will continue on this lecture. You can already download it if you have not done it already. We just cover now the definition of demography, and we'll continue here in the next uh, lecture. And it's better for you if you read the chapter before uh, I, I talk about the chapter in the classroom, because then you can have more questions and we can have more interaction in the classroom. Thank you very much, and I see you guys on Thursday. I don't know which room I will send an email about. Thank you. <laughs>